it is not uncommon for romantic works uh, to not only um, ask the viewer to respond on an emotional level, but also to do so as a way of making a kind of political statement. And Jericho's Raft of the Medusa, painted between 1817 and 1819, is a really great example of that. Um, as a way to sort of drive home an interesting point, the when we've the the paintings we've looked at so far during this early discussion of neoclassicism and romanticism are largely to be found in the same museum in Paris. That museum is called the Louvre, and I've already showed you this work, which shows you David's Oath of the Harati and the lictors bringing back to Brutus the bodies of his children um, uh, on the same wall in the Louvre. And when you turn around, you can see this one, which is the coronation of Napoleon in the same wall, in the same room uh, in the Louvre. And then when you looking at Napoleon's painting and you make a left-hand turn and you look straight ahead of you, you will see this, Ang's Grand Odalisque in the same room in the Louvre. And if you walk through a little doorway just to the side of Ang's Odalisque, you get to see Jericho's Wrath of the Medusa, another enormous painting done as part of the French Romantic movement. As is my want, I want to tell you about the story before I want to tell you about the painting. And in order to tell you about the story, we need to go back to our French tyrant, Napoleon. And because it tangentially um, relates to him. Now, say what we will about Napoleon the tyrant. Napoleon the tyrant became the emperor of the French because of his own skill and not because of his own birth. Napoleon's not even French. He's born on the island of Corsica. Um, he, as a matter of fact, when he trains at a at a at an artillery school uh, in the southern part of France, his French is so bad that he's ridiculed for it. Um, last summer, I read an enormous biography of of Napoleon by a, an author named Andrew Roberts, and it sort of chronicles. Napoleon's written French because his letters survive and early on he could not write in French well. So all of that is to say the following point. Napoleon became emperor of France because Napoleon had skill. I'm not saying it's good skill. I'm just saying it was because of his own talent and ability. And the reason why the king of France was the king of France not, was not because of skill. It's because he happened to be the oldest son of the king of France. Right? That's it. And Napoleon, if nothing else, helped establish a meritocracy in France. And this was the idea that on the basis only of your own talent, ability, drive, and ambition, you could become something in this world, right? I'd like to think that that's sort of the way the United States works. And to be perfectly honest, I am the result of a whole bunch of white privilege in my own life. Like I sort of acknowledge that without doubt. I've, I'm, I'm from a a remarkably middle-class family. My dad went to college. My dad believed in education. My dad bought me books whenever I wanted. My dad encouraged me to go to school. And I'll be perfectly honest, once I got to university, my dad washed his hands and said, go pay for that. But I never would have been even thought about that had it not been for all of the things my dad did for me, right? So that's part of my story. But the other part of my story is yeah, I went to college and yeah, I studied hard and yeah, I learned how to write and yeah, I got a master's degree and yeah, I got a PhD and yeah, I went and got a job and went in that job. I went and taught like crazy and wrote a lot of stuff and did everything I could in my job to be, help the job, the school become better. And yeah, I became a Fulbright scholar and all of that. And then at the age of 41, I became a full professor and an associate dean. And I'd like to think that part of that professional growth is because of my own merit. There are other things involved as well, but my merit, I hope, is part of that. That's the world that Napoleon wanted in France. But the aristocracy doesn't view the world that way. Like, the reason why the king isn't the king be is not because of merit, but because of birth. And Napoleon was eventually exiled from France in 1814 sent to the island of Elba. 
And as a result, we have the restoration of the Bourbon dynasty, right? It's no longer the emperor, right? It's the king of France again. A different king of France, I grant you, but part of the same line. And the reason why this man became the king of France and, and not somebody else was not because of his merit, but because of his bloodline, something he had nothing to do with. And so what happens when we have the return of the old way of life? Well, to begin with, we have a return to the governmental structure um, that was prevalent beforehand. And what I mean to, su what I suggest with this is that there is a certain right that kings think they have as it pertains to governmental posts and that you can put whoever you want in whatever post you want because you're actually the king. And that's that. You don't have to ask people. It's your job. And so this is really true now. What happens is the king, who is King Louis the Eighteenth, uh, and then eventually, well, let me back up. Louis the Eighteenth um, comes back for just a little bit, um, and then in time we have a second return. Louis the Eighteenth um, um, is the grandson of Louis the Fifteenth, and he's the younger brother of Louis the Sixteenth. Um, and he becomes the king of France on the 7th of July, 1815, when um, Napoleon is exiled. And so he comes into power and he begins to fill important governmental posts with people who are his friends. They might not necessarily be the right person for the job, but they're his friends. And those friends who have jobs, not because of their own merit, but because of their friendship, also post people to positions of importance, not because of their own merit, but because they're friends. And those people also appoint people to positions of importance, not because of merit, but because of their friends. And so this goes down and down until, in some ways, Louis XVIII is the result for people becoming captains of state-run naval ships who are not sailors, but rather friends of a friend of a friend. And the 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 British or the French frigate, the Medusa, is a great example of this. The person who was the captain of that of that frigate was not a sailor; it was a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a guy who knew Louis the Eighteenth. And when sailing around the west part of Africa with the inability to read a navigational map, the captain of that vessel ran it aground and it sank. And in the time of its sinking, the captain and those on the ship quickly secured all of the lifeboats and rowed away from the vessel that was sinking, leaving the rest of the men and women on it to attempt to create a life raft from broken pieces of timber. Now we have a saying, that the captain is supposed to go down with his ship, this captain did not think so. And he didn't think so because he wasn't a naval captain. He was a friend of a friend of a, and et cetera. So what happened is the people who survived did so on this makeshift raft they constructed of bits and pieces of this enormous frigate that they pulled from it as it was sinking. The people on the life raft sailed away and they sailed away, leaving the people on this vessel to fight for their lives. And it took two weeks before they, before they finally were rescued. Two weeks without food, two weeks drinking nothing but seawater, which does more harm than good. Two weeks in the sun. This, when news got back to France, became quite the political scandal. And there's sort of a, a saying from the Watergate time uh, in American history, is, and that it's, it's not so much the crime, it's the cover-up. And what the French government tried to do 
was to cover this up. But slowly, these people got back to France and they did what you would expect them to do. They told their story about the sinking of the ship, the unprofessional behavior of the captain and his crew. They told the story of their suffering, of the death, destruction, mayhem, and terror that was on this life raft as people uh, died, to de died of starvation, of thirst, as they resorted to cannibalism. And then in 1817, Jericho made this painting. And in 1819, he wanted to put it in the annual French Salon, the officially sponsored French arts uh, art ex exhibit, I mean, paid for by the government. They did it every two years. And so Jericho submitted this to the annual French Salon. And what does this painting say? It says, the government is corrupt. And the government said, no thank you, Theodore. We don't want your painting. And so Theodore did what you would expect him to do. He rolled up this painting, he took it to London, and he went to the, the, the Royal Academy of Art for their annual show and says, I have a great painting. It announces that the French government is corrupt. Would you like to show it? And the, the British government said, it's nice to see you, Theodore. Because do they want a painting that announces the incompetence of the French monarchy? Of course they do. This painting is a masterpiece of the French Romantic period. And, it, and, and Jericho has arranged this around a pyramidal structure that is so balanced and symmetrical in ways that it's almost it's almost renaissance in its nature. I mean, artists like Raphael and Leonardo utilize this pyramidal structure. You can see the top of this broken mast here, the sail, the lines that tie it to the edge of the raft. This forms the basis of the first pyramid. But we have a second pyramid here that is established by the African man here, waving, uh, it looks to be a flag, but it's not, and forms this pyramidal. Jericho worked through a variety of, of, um, of different formats for this composition. This was one of his final sketches. And I ask you to think about the ways in which these two objects are different. What's the most important difference? I know one's a drawing, but one's a painting. But what's the most important difference? Here is their rescue. And when you see this ship in relationship to this raft, their, their rescue seems pretty certain, doesn't? But here's this painting. And there's the rescue ship. And now all of a sudden their rescue is more uncertain. And so Jericho goes out of his way to de-emphasize the rescue which is on the way. And I think that's a really important idea. Jericho, as an art maker, of course knows his art history. It's what great artists do. And so he's pulling from some ideas from the classical past, right? Or from the, the artistic past. So here is this man. And in a, in, a, in a paper he wrote, he described the sorrow of a man holding the dead body of his son. And here you can see the ways in which he's borrowed that off of this image of Heraclitus from Raphael's School of Athens. The figures here all crawling up. Think about the dramatic sky, the waves. I mean, I don't know a whole lot about seafaring, but this wave right there doesn't look so good for the people on this here life raft because all things considered, this is a scary feel, a scary painting. When you look at this work, you you're overwhelmed with the idea of grief, of pain, of suffering. This is a painting in which feeling is all. Jericho is pulling out all the romantic stops as a way 
of, of speaking to this pain and suffering. And another art maker who does something kind of similar is Eugene Delacroix. And this painting done in 1830 is called Liberty Leading the People. And I mentioned to you uh, in one of our recent artifacts that there is this idea that that um, that the French are good for a new revolution pretty much every 20 years or so. And a good example of that happens um, in the year 1830. The monarchy goes through some changes. Again, I mentioned Louis XVIII, who was the monarch um, immediately following the Bourbon Restoration. And eventually uh, he steps down in, I think, 1824, and he's replaced by Charles V. Charles V um, is eventually kicked out on the 2nd of August when we have Louis the 19th uh, come to power. When we have the removal of one monarch uh, and being replaced by another monarch, then we have a revolution. And this revolution that you see here um, was because of the July Revolution of 1830. Um, if you've ever read Hugo's novel or seen the musical or movie version of Les Miserables, this is essentially the scene that, or this is the time frame that we are um, looking at here. This king of France, is king until he's expelled himself by Louis Philippe, the so-called citizen king. And that happens in 1836. But let's think about who and what we see here, reminding ourselves, of course, that this was the cover of a, of a Coldplay album. And I, gosh, I must have been 2008 or so, 2009, somewhere around there. Okay. What do you see? And, but, and almost to the point, what do you see? Who and what? So I'll start. We have a striving figure in the middle part of the composition. It is a woman. The woman is wearing a special kind of cap, and I'll show you a detail of that in a second. It looks sort of like an emoji. Um, this is called a Phrygian cap. A Phrygian cap. This is an ancient Roman symbol of a freed slave. So if you were a slave and you were given your freedom, you would be given this. It's called a Phrygian cap. And a Phrygian cap is a symbol of a slave of a of, of freed slave's former um, enslavement. And so in ancient Roman times, they wouldn't wear the cap, actually. Sometimes they would carry it around on a stick. It would be like, a, like the ski lift ticket we, we talked about when, when talking about Gisalbertus's depictions of pilgrims. This symbolizes liberty, right? The woman is shown carrying the French tricolor flag, blue on the mast end, white and then red. She is nude to the waist, her bodice having been torn open, both of her breasts exposed, and she carries a musket with a bayonet on it. I think it's a musket. It could be a rifle, but I think it's a musket. This figure is not a portrait of Susie. There was no woman running around with a flag with her top off, um, yelling, follow me, like she's Henry V. This isn't a portrait. Instead, it's an allegorical representation, right? What this means is she's not a person. She's a symbol for something. And that symbol is liberty, right? It's freedom. And in this instance, we might actually say, revolution. So she's not a portrait. She's a symbol. And actually, the people around this competition, around this composition, are not so much portraits, but rather depictions of types. Depictions of types. So this might not be necessarily a portrait of, of Stephen, but rather it is a type. And this type is a young boy 
who is illogically whipping around two pistols like he's part of the Old West. And he's got like a paper boy hat on. And around his shoulder, he has like a crossbody bag. And on that is a crest. It looks like a little crest. And I was really, really curious as to what this was. And so after a whole lot of research, I discovered that this is a um, is a like the school symbol of a polytechnic school in France. So he is a student at a polytechnic school. He represents young people. Just to the left of Our Lady Liberty, we have this man here. You can see he has on a top hat, a dark suit, a white shirt with a cravat. This man represents the uh, the white collar cloud crowd, right? So in 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 the uh, in in the in the world of of economics, we can think of people who are blue collar and people who are white collar. White collar you can think of as bankers. Blue collar um, auto mechanics. Right. So this person represents um, the the white collar crowd. And look at this guy. He's holding a gun. Next to him is this guy here. He has um, a good two day shadow. He's holding rather inexplicably a rapier. And if you hadn't noticed, he has a gun in his waistband, which is not something I recommend. This guy is shown more blue collar, more working class uh, than middle or upper, upper class. Here we have this figure um, at the feet of liberty. Um, and think about colors, right? I, I'm, I'm, as you've heard me say before, Nothing is by accident, right? There are no art history accidents. Everything is there for a reason. And so think about this red, that peak of white and that blue. Gee, I wonder where we might have seen that color pattern there. So this figure sort of creeping up towards the, towards, um, uh, the figure of liberty. And then we have other people, people who are dead and dying people who have already lost their lives. This painting suggests that this revolution, the, the, the July revolution of 1830 was for everyone, the young, the old, the wealthy, the less so. And Delacroix wants us to know where we are are because if you look over the shoulder of this young boy you see this now this might not look that familiar to you because you don't live in paris but i know what that building is that building is this it's notre dame you've seen this before and because you see this side of the tower and you see this part of the church we know that where this scene happens is over here on the other side of the Seine. We know, I mean, I could, we could walk to where this place is because of we know the position of this church. So this is happening in the, the, the east side of the Seine. This example shows the ways in which romantic artists like Delacroix and, and Jericho can use art as a way of saying something political. My favorite three words in this class, art does work. There's a British artist who I love and I, and I love him for a lot of different reasons. And I just wanna show you some of his paintings because he is gonna both be the most important artist. Oh, excuse me as I stretch. Oh, he's going to be the most important artists for the Impressionists who will follow him 40 years later. And his name is Joseph Mallard William Turner. Turner is uh, an English romantic landscape painter um, who 
travels all over Europe and does these beautiful, ethereal, soupy, atmospheric portraits. I mean, the thing he's most well known for is clouds and water and mist and vapor. Um, the image you're looking at here is a scene from his Venice time. Um, and over here in, in 1833, the houses of parliament burned down and Turner did what any good artist would do. He grabbed his easel and his paintbrushes and he went to the other side of the Thames in order to paint it. Turner does things like this. And I love them. Like the image on the, the left is rain, steam, and speed. And you can see there's a bridge here with a train coming across it. A little rabbit over here running and a boat on the river. And this, this is the whale ship. His most famous image is this. It's called the slave ship. It dates from 1840. And it's a complicated painting, but I think if you, you can just appreciate it from an atmospheric point of view. We have this beautiful sort of setting sun, the, the, the orange ripping apart the, the daytime sky, these dark clouds. We have this ship um, and the ship, the slaves on it have been thrown overboard because they've been ill. Um, and in order to claim them as being lost at sea, they have to, um, the, the ship company has to claim that they jumped overboard rather than they died because of illness. And so they got sick, threw them overboard, and you can sort of see here in the corners, fish and shark eating them. So this was quite a political painting in 1840 because England at this time has outlawed slavery. United States doesn't get there for another 25 years, but the abolitionistic movement in England dates from the end of the 18th century and the United States being slow in a lot of ways doesn't get there for another 75 years. The painting I want to talk about now is the one on the left hand side. It's a work by a British born but American artist by the name of Thomas Cole. Uh, this work is called the Oxbow. Um, and I'm always delighted to talk about the Oxbow because the, the Thomas Cole expert of the world um, was a man named Elwood C. Perry III. Um, he finished his PhD at Yale, I think, in 1972, taught at Columbia for six years, then went to the University of Iowa. And in 1980, he landed at the University of Arizona, um, and he was my master's advisor. Um, he passed away in 2005, and he was a very, very good man, um, one, of the, one of the real highlights of my professional life is when the university did a memorial service for him, um, I was asked to come back and speak on his behalf. And so uh, a good, good man uh, who was the Thomas Cole expert of the world. And, and so it's always nice for me to, um, to, to have a little bit of time to think about a man who, who provided me with so much guidance and wisdom um, in the several years that I knew him. This is Cole's most famous work, and we can divide it, I think, into left and right sides, sort of divided here by a diagonal line that goes from the lower right sweeping up to the, the upper left. This depiction here is of an actual part of a bend in the Connecticut River. The river kind of goes like this. It kind of comes down and then does this crazy loop here and then comes around this way and goes whoosh. And if we were to think about this in terms of left and right-hand side, we can think about the ways in which the right-hand side has been manicured and taken over by humankind, and that the left-hand side is still tamed and wild and not yet manipulated by humankind. And if you look really closely, you can see a picture of Thomas Cole, a small self-portrait of himself sitting here with an easel and a canvas. And sometimes we think about paintings as being like, so artists will do a portrait of themselves in their studio. Like Rembrandt does this. I mean, we can even think about the Goya and the Velasquez paintings as being a portrait of an artist in his studio. And Cole would suggest to you that the outside landscape was his studio. 
So this in a way is kind of an artist in his studio. And I think that's a clever way to think about this composition. Here is the bend of that river, and here is the the part of 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 the 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 land where you can see he has paid particular attention to the ways in which that land has been manipulated by mankind. Right? We have we have houses, we have farms, we have irrigation and and agriculture, and this is the ways in which we can create, take the land and put it to our own uses. If we think about this part of the land, this is a little bit different, isn't it? This is wild land. This is land that has not yet been taken over. And this idea, I think, is the purpose of this painting. Farms, wild. Now let's think about this in a slightly different way. In 1804, Thomas Jefferson purchases a large tract of land from France. And that tract of land was called the Louisiana Purchase. In 1804, our third president essentially almost triples the size, maybe even more so, of the United States. And quite suddenly, the United States of America went from the Atlantic seaboard to the Pacific seaboard. And beginning in the 1820s, a phrase began to get thrown around. That phrase was called manifest destiny. Manifest destiny. This two-word phrase suggested that this land, this United States of America, was meant to be civilized by me and but I and the way I use the word me I mean the white man that there was this inevitable progress of the United States and those who lived on it that we were going to settle this entire tract of land and one of the ideas that very much permeates American history during the 19th century is this idea of westward expansion. Because beginning in, in the, the 18 teens, the United States is like less than 20 states. We, we don't even go to the Mississippi River. And all of a sudden, it's the Mississippi River all the way to Oregon. And there were people who believed at the beginning of, of this westward expansion, that it would take a thousand years to settle the United States of America as it pertained to the land that we owned. And by the end of the 19th century, uh, there was a historian, his name was Jackson Turner. He said, you know what? The frontier's closed. And what he meant, suggested was, we've settled. Like we, we've taken over this part of the land. Um, think about Louisiana. Right. Ruston, um, like Ruston, Louisiana, I think was founded um, in the 1880s. It wasn't a big town, but the university was started in 1892. The school I was at before I came here was founded in 1856 in Dubuque, Iowa. So think about that. How far did we come by the 1850s? They had begun an all women's school there. This painting, in some ways, is about that. Imagine you're holding a map. Which way is east on that map? Is it on your left-hand side or your right-hand side? Because I bet it's on your right-hand side. This is the right-hand side, right? It shows that progression of civilization. This is settled. This is manifest destiny. And this is the place we're going to next. I think Cole is commenting about manifest destiny and about that progression of the westward rule of society. And so when we look at this, clearly you can see the artist touched. There's not necessarily a moral message here, although some romantic paintings sort of have a political message. It might not be a moral one. This painting is certainly about depicting a lovely bend in the Connecticut River, but it's also about the westward expansion of the United States from the Atlantic seaboard where it was 
moving its way west until the Pacific seaboard, where it will become. This is Romanticism. Our next job to tackle, our next artistic period to, dis to discover, our next artifact will be about realism with a capital R. And in doing so, we'll be able to talk about economics, Karl Marx, and the reason why Courbet does not paint angels. Bye.